Um, yes, so actually, um, this talk is basically about graphical languages. So um, first I thought it was a fairly sort of intellectual exercise. I wasn't even sure um, there was all the data names to, uh, to quantum computing and so on. But actually yesterday we heard um, at least four different people mentioning in their talks some kind of compact or autonomous categories in which in which the objects are self dual Okay, so maybe it is actually a fairly timely uh, talk to give. So this is what it's about. Uh, right, so let me first quickly state the definition of autonomous category. I think you've seen it at least um, three or four times yesterday and also a hundred times last week at the school. Uh, a right call for an object in a category is just another object B, so that there exists this epsilon and beta, satisfying the two equations um, that we have now always written as the S shaped thing and the other S shaped thing. Um, and now uh, left dual is defined similarly, and the category is right autonomous if every object has a right dual like that. Uh, sorry, autonomous if it has a right and left dual. We're only going to work with right autonomous categories in this talk, as it happens. So, um, so, the, so one really remarkable thing about this definition of autonomous category is that it requires absolutely no coherence conditions, unlike, say, the definition of monoidal category. You just have the, the epsilon and the eta, the two equations, and that's it. So you might wonder, why is there no coherence condition? Um, well, <coughs> You might expect there to be a coherence diagram, for example, somehow relating the dual of uh, uh, relating the dual of a tensor b, for example, to the dual of a and the dual of b. And in fact, there is an equation, uh, an isomorphism, right, between a tensor b. So the dual of a tensor b is the same as the dual of b tensor the dual of a. And you would expect there to be some kind of coherence requirement, like if, you know, this is the diagram that you would expect that beta sub a tensor b, which goes from here to here, should be related to the thing you can build from beta sub a and beta sub b. So the, the diagram for that is, um, uh, that just looks like this. This is a, and a star. Here you have, uh, I guess in this case, uh, epsilon, sorry for the diagram, the wrong way. So for beta, this is eta sub a, this is eta sub a, uh, eta sub a, eta sub a, and of course you expect the picture for eta sub a tensor b, this is a tensor b here, you expect that to be the same picture, and it is, and that's what that coherence diagram expresses. So why is this coherence diagram not part of the definition? Because this diagram actually is the definition of this isomorphism, k sub a, b. So you automatically get that somehow. Um, and, and, and similarly, what you So this is very nice. This tells you that the definition of autonomous is really completely um, canonical somehow. You can't really tinker with it in any way. Uh, uh, and also, that if the right tools exist, then they're also uniquely determined. So actually, being autonomous or right autonomous is just a property of a model category. It either has it or it doesn't, but it can't have it. Okay, now um, I, people always talk about compact closed and dagger compact closed categories and so on. And the terminology is eternally confusing. So sometimes people will want to speak about non, non symmetric compact categories, but these things actually have different names and so on. <coughs> Autonomous means just what I said on the first slide, so we did not assume symmetry, right? If we also assume symmetry, then it's called a compact closed category. So that's exactly the same thing as autonomous and symmetric monoidal. And, you know, two different properties of a monoidal category. So there are no additional axioms relating the two. And um, a bit more general, if your category has a gradient instead of a symmetry, then it's called, and if it's also autonomous, then it's called tortile. Okay. It turns out if you have a gradient and, and, the, um, and the autonomous structure, you automatically have to have a twist because you can draw this diagram, which is just like a yanking diagram. <coughs> And uh, it does have one additional answer. So actually, I will talk just about tortile categories later. But um, that's just because anything you say about anything you, you say about a tortile category immediately becomes a statement about compact closed categories. Simply if you assume that the gradient is actually a symmetry, or if you say additional x, 
axioms, it, it's just that right? any statement about profile categories is also true for compact closed categories. <coughs> okay, so yesterday we saw actually at least four different speakers talking about uh, objects in an autonomous category that was self dual. So John Myers mentioned this, he mentioned the, uh, mentioned the category of representations uh, um, of finite groups or compact groups. So um, certain ones of these group representations are self dual, and he mentioned that these are exactly the real or quaternionic ones, but not the complex ones somehow. So these self dual objects are, are interesting in that, um, in that context. Ross Duncan mentioned it in, uh, in the context of convex operational models, so these convex spaces often tend to be self-dual, and when they are, there's an interesting property. Um, Bruce and Jamie mentioned Corbinus algebra structures, and, and uh, so that's, that's something like this. Little, uh, some people call this a pair of pants, right, uh, in co-organisms. Um, anytime you have a Corbinus algebra structure, it automatically means it's a compact closed structure, uh, because you can just cap off the end of that pair of pants, right? And you do it on the other side and the Carbonimus equation telling you that it satisfies <coughs> the right equations. But the structure you get from this is always so that A star is equal to A. <coughs> and Mark Jacobs mentioned self-dual objects in a more general context of involutive categories, of which autonomous categories are an example, right? Or actually they're not, but um, let's say dagger. Autonomous categories are an example of that. <coughs> so, so, okay, so we should study these things actually and be careful about how we do it. Um, now, one could be interested in two different things. One can be interested in a particular object being self dual, or one could be interested in all of the objects of the categories being self dual. If you have a category where objects are typically not self dual, like group representations, then for a particular one to be self dual is an interesting property. But the other categories, uh, where all objects are canonically self-dual, for example, if you take real filtered spaces instead of complex, then, then every object is a canonical way of identifying it with its dual. And that's how you call it a natural example, but there are also unnatural examples. For example, if we call it so in complex filtered spaces, of course, the objects are not self-dual, but you could always say, well, I'm going to choose a basis on each, on each filtered space, and then you can more or less by brute force the things to be self-dual, but that involves a choice of a basis or a classical structure. So because there are these examples around, one might ask what, um, what kind of axioms one should ask of these, of these examples. So the naive, so, so let's axiomatize autonomous categories where all objects are self-dual. Right? So the first thing we could sort of naively do is we could simply postulate that A uh, is equal to A star. Okay, these were the axioms of autonomous categories, they're very simple, very, um, very deceptive. We could just postulate that A is equal to A star, and then we could just state that for every object A, there exists this eta hat, which goes from I to A tensor A, and epsilon hat, which goes from A tensor A to I, satisfying the same two diagrams. Of course, if you had such a category, it would be autonomous, in particular. Right? But the question is, should we now require some coherence conditions? Right? Uh, maybe you think no, because we didn't have to do it for the autonomous categories, but actually that, that turns out to be um, to be wrong. Okay, because setting you know setting a equal to a star is actually quite quite um it's not at all a benign operation, it's quite a nasty um, a big big uh, operation to do because when you set a equal to a star all other kinds of, you know, you get a lot of other um, a structure that you suddenly have, and you need that structure to satisfy coherence. For example, so when we said A equal to, so, so right, in any autonomous category, we have this isomorphism that, that we talked about before, which came from this diagram here. Right? Now, if every object is equal to its own dual, you immediately get that A tensor B is isomorphic to B tensor A. Uh, and uh, so in an arbitrary autonomous category, you have no such thing. But if you do get these isomorphisms from A tensor B to B tensor A, then how are you going to draw this as a, as a diagram? Um, the only way I can think of is drawing it as some kind of a crossing, 
Is that isomorphism automatically natural? That isomorphism is not automatically natural either, no. Because you see, um, uh, A star is a contravariant functor, so when we require isomorphism, so right, one of the, if you just want to sort of set A equal or isomorphic to A star, the first thing, the first sort of axiom you think of is, ah, it should be a natural isomorphism, right? But that doesn't work because a covariant functor can't be natural isomorphic, naturally isomorphic to a contravariant one. we have 
have to twist the whole, the whole strand of two models. And that's why this equation is there. And then the, what the graphical language, you know, it's, it's obvious what it will mean for, for an axiom to be sound. It just means that if you draw the diagram for the left hand side and the diagram for the right hand side, then up to isotopy of moving around these framed uh, tangles, that they're the same. Okay, so here's my first set of axioms. I'm actually going to give you three different sets of axioms, um, depending on which structure we assume to already exist previously in the category and depending on which structure we want to actually add. So here's the, the sort of most canonical way to do it. Is we start with something that's already a tortile category, so it already has a symmetry and a twist. And now we add these half-twist maps, and then we want to uh, write down the properties the half-twist has to satisfy. Okay, so um, this is very simple, and I can go through it in, in like one minute. But I do want to mention that it took several months to actually boil this down to five axioms. Okay, so initially I had maybe ten or eleven axioms, and you know I tried to prove that they're independent. And after a while, it turns out everything follows from these five. Okay, so that's you know that's it's not just something you do with the back of an envelope. Okay, so the first axiom is that H sub A is an isomorphism. Uh, this axiom you've already seen. H sub the, uh, the nothing object, of course, should just be essentially the identity. So I here is the tensor unit, uh, so that's zero wires. Right? If you twist zero wires, it's, it's the same as doing nothing at all. And then we have this axiom T2, which um, I've written it here. Um, I've written this H here upside down. I might have as well written H sub A quantity star, right? So basically what axiom T2 is saying is that if you, to do, if you do two half twists, then it's equal to one full twist. Okay. That's what that axiom is saying. And, um, and T5 is the interesting axiom in some sense. Because, um, you see, uh, axioms T2, T3, and T4 um, have an interesting structure among them. Because this one talks about they talk about how to do H on composite objects, right? This one talks about how to do H on a tensor, if you already know how to do H on the components. This one talks about how to do H on A star, if you already know how to do H on A, right? And this one talks about how to do H on I, right? So if you have some kind of categories where the objects were freely generated, if you knew what H was at all the generators, then you could use axes T2, 3, and 4 to just lift H to all the other objects. Right. So in some sense, it's natural that we should have just one axiom for each object we start here. Um, obviously, T1 is um, sort of a triviality, um, but T5 is in some sense the interesting axiom because it actually says something about the property that H has to satisfy other than how it leads to composite objects. Excuse me? Um, Excuse me? Yes? Um, shouldn't you use in the T5 axiom the inverse baby? I'm sorry? Shouldn't you use in the T5 axiom the inverse gradient? Um, you have the same gradient for T4 and T5. You would think so, but not. Because this ring here, if you turn it up, it's this, this part here is actually turned by 90 degrees. You could, you could write this whole right hand side up instead of to the right. And you would realize that this is actually an inverse. So if you, do, if you have a, remember that this, twist here, this one, is actually equal to one of these gradients, but what's written here is equal to the inverse, so yeah, all the triangle show me is about these two things actually are equal. Right. I know it's strange. Oh, this is also a possibility of my mistake, but I don't think so. You can talk to But, you know, whatever. If, right. No, you, you write down the axiom, that's, there's a unique axiom of this shape, which is um, just the one. This is supposed to be t I'm sorry? What's K sub I? When you said A sub I? Oh, um, K sub I was just the, the isomorphism between I and I star, which comes from the non-local structure. Right. Um, so, I, I've already made several of these remarks. Axioms to, to T2 to T4 just allow you to lift everything to the composite objects. Um, there's also the dilemma saying that if T5 holds at the atomic objects that, that you extended using T2 to T4, then time T5 also holds for those composite objects. So that's nice for constructing examples, especially the non-natural kind. Right? You can, uh, on each sort of, you, you can make a category where you build 
basic objects are Hilbert spaces that you choose your basis arbitrarily, right? But then when you want to choose your basis on A tensor B, you have to choose it in such a way that it comes on the basis of A and B. Um, and, and, and it's true, in fact, that these five axes are also complete for the graphical language. Again, um, uh, it took about almost a year. The proof is relatively easy, but it took me almost a year to see why the proof was relatively easy. <laughs> Well, it's not. It's a. It's a. It's a consequence of something non-trivial, which is the completeness of the graphical language for four-top categories. Okay, I've already mentioned examples. So there are these natural ones where um, the objects are automatically equipped with the self-duality, and then there are the non-natural ones where you have to equip it right uh, somehow artificially. And in fact, you can do that for any four-top category, as you kind of expect. Make a new category where the objects are pairs of an object of the old category and its self duality, right? And then the question is just how do you find the tensor of that? Right? And it turns out that the obvious thing works. Okay, now I said in the beginning that if we started with just an autonomous category, not a tortile category, but just an autonomous one, not even no braining or anything, and we required the self duality, we would automatically get something that looks like a braining and something that looks like a twist. So we can also do the axioms in a different way. And this is what this slide is. Where we start uh, a priori with just an autonomous category, then we impose this, this family of maps. Okay? And now we can just write down axioms so that the structure will be torqued up. Right? Um, and if, and if it's, um, it's, it's interesting to, to write down the axioms this way as well. So, um, so here are the axioms, of course, again, H, A, so the first two axioms are, are the same. Right, when you have an isomorphism between A and A star, then for every map from A to B, you immediately get a map from A star to B star, of course. You already have a map from B star to A star from the autonomous structure, but now you also get one from A star to B star. So let's write that as F lower sharp. Then we have several axioms that are sort of fairly natural looking, like that the sharp should come in with the star. Um, this one says that the sharp commutes with the tensor in, in, in the appropriate way. This one says that the associativity map is quote unquote unitary with respect to, to its sharp operation. And, um, and, and one, interestingly, one has to require this, but for all the other maps, like uh, left and right unit and so on, it follows. Just for associativity, it has to be an axiom. And you have these other, and then the last two are maybe interesting. Because these are really um, sort of strange properties that the H has. You didn't see this in the previous axiom because we mix this with gradients and twists and so on. But if you really want to talk about just what the H itself satisfies, it satisfies some rather strange uh, equations like this one here. And um, I guess this last one is a sort of yanking, right? Because the H inside this inside each of these H boxes is really half twist, so that looks something like a braiding, maybe. With and twist it. So this is like an X-shaped thing and then you get something like a yanking axiom here. And that first one is, is actually a hexagon axiom for, um, for ensuring that the gradient will satisfy the gradient equation. And these are some other consequences of the axioms I just wrote. So in particular I want to point out this one, saying that H also satisfies something like the yang baxter equation. It's a consequence of the, of the axioms. And, and also that H is, is natural. I think someone mentioned uh, that we had to require the nature was natural. I said it was going to be an axiom, but actually I thought it was going to be a consequence. Uh, and, and the theorem is just that these, these five axioms are equivalent to these eight. I think I just said it, didn't I? So anyway, the, the, the T axioms are equivalent to the A axioms. So if you will. Um, so a tortile category says having T1 to T5 is the same as an autonomous category. Now, uh, since this is a sort of dagger conference, uh, I do want to point out that there is obviously an induced dagger structure on any such self-dual autonomous category, where um, you just go from B to A by going first to B star and then F star and then go back to A. Now, that is not a good dagger structure. This is actually a very bad dagger structure. Um, because when you have a dagger something has where you expect all the natural isomorphisms of the structure to be unitary. Okay? And here it's true, for example, for all the monoidal structures.
architecture, so uh, uh, associativity and the left and right unit maps, they're all unitary, but not the braiding and not the twist. And this really is a problem, okay? So in particular, this is not a dagger tortoise category, even though it is a tortoise category that is dagger monoidal. Uh, it's important that the braiding and twist maps should be unitary. So what this dagger does, so to say the pictures, the ordinary dagger should just take the mirror image of the picture, whereas what this dagger does is it turns the picture by 180 meters. So if it were compact, the mirror that would be the same as the mirror image, right? But in the Tortoise case, it isn't because when you go to a gradient, it's not the same. Um, now you might think that in a compact, if the category happens to be compact, then maybe this is a good dagger structure because of what I just said. But it's also not true. Right? In pyramid spaces, for example, if you do the self duality by brute forward the, um, um, choosing bases on every object, then this dagger structure is not the one that comes from the adjointments. In particular, the, the, the dagger of a theater will be itself and not the complex conjugate. So it's just really not a good dagger structure, but you know, I think it's important to make a big deal of this because otherwise people are going to use it as a dagger structure and nothing you really want to do but work. Um, now, finally, I said I was going to go back to strict self duality. What if A star is actually equal to A? Right? So we can postulate this eta hat and, and epsilon hat. And in fact, we can define them in terms of the previous structure like this. Or if we're given, so if we're given H and the regular eta and epsilon, we can define these hat eta and epsilon, and conversely so. So any, any, any two of these things determine the third, right? because of these equations here. So we can also give an equivalent accentization just in terms of eta hat, epsilon hat, and h sub a. Okay. And that's the strict version of the structure. So I will just show you the accents, they're very brief, right? So of course you have to have this, you have to have this. Here's some trivial accent, accents, for example, well, once you have, this is also compact close, so you can take star of a map, right? But a star is equal to a, then the map for map f star, it's just going to go from B to A, when it goes from A to B. So you have equations like this and like this, and, and then you have some really wacky looking ones. Okay? You have to require these. You can't just have eta hat and epsilon hat and not, not have any axes. You have to have these axes if, if, you're gonna, if it's going to be equivalent to the other structure that, that you know, we all agree was fairly natural. Right? So, so this one maybe is also a natural thing, you know, if you, the, the point is, I've written these things with a dot, right, because you could apply this to a tensor, A tensor, B tensor, C, and that means if this goes from A tensor, B tensor, C, tensor, A tensor, B tensor, C to I, then of course there have to be some, some wires crossing somewhere, right, you can, can no longer draw it in this way, or the eta hat of that cell hat. And that's why I put a white dot in here, I made it white so it doesn't look like a spider. Um, so you require these things to be equal, but then you have, for example, this has to be equal to that. Okay, go figure. It's some sort of version of a brain equation, actually. And then and I put in M7 and M8, kind um, of at the last minute, I'm just to make sure the theorem would be true. I'm pretty sure they follow from the other axioms. And then there's M9 and M10 that talk about H. Okay. And th there's an interesting observation here, which is that of the 10 axioms I just stated, the first H can be said entirely without reference to H, only about epsilon hat and eta hat, but the last one, the last two, only the last two talk about H, right? And, um, but it is, there are examples of a category of categories that have the epsilon hat and the eta hat and have all the structure but don't have an H that makes the last, don't, that don't have a half twist. So half twist doesn't follow from eta hat and epsilon hat. It's an additional thing you have to have and it has to satisfy this axiom M10 here. However, every time you have such a category that doesn't have a half twist, you can faithfully embed it in a category that does have one. Basically, you will make infinitely many copies of each object and um, you, you define H to be the identity, but you define the eta hat on A star to be something really complicated on A. Right, and then it turns out that this works. So that means, in particular, that so this, what I just said implies that axioms M9 and M10 are conservative over the other axioms. Every time you have an equation following from the 10 axioms, 
If the equation doesn't mention h, then it already follows from the h axioms. Right? So it's a fairly sensible structure to just have eta hat of epsilon hat of the eta axioms. And then you can always generate the h part of it. Okay, so that's it. Um, uh, yep, so usually people have you know, a whole slide full of future work, but actually, in some sense, this particular thing is done. All right. uh, uh, the, the actual motivation was, you see, I wrote this survey paper on graphical languages for one of the categories that some of you have seen, and uh, it's in this fat book that uh, Bob has outside. And this was actually one of the cases I thought should be in that paper, but was just you know, far too complicated to do, to actually put it in the paper, so, so I worked this out. But what I really wanted to work out and have not yet is what if you want to have a chosen Frobenius algebra structure on all of the objects of your category. That implies a self-dual autonomous structure, so you would expect that there should be also lots of coherence um, equations and so on, you, you know, and, um, and that there's a graphical language, so we should be able to generate these equations So I haven't done that yet. Right. Maybe someone else will do it for a change. But I'm always the guy who knows how to do this. Categories, and for two categories, you're going to have even more 
require or not require gradients at every dimension, levels, and so on. So yes, you, you can you can do this with the same manifolds and so on. Uh, and you can first of all change the dimension of the embedding of the of the surrounding. 